Well, hello there, and welcome back to the studio again. This is going to be a kind of a different uh, camera setup yet again, as I am experimenting with ways to guide you along the painting. Today's episode is going to be a Rembrandt master study, so I'm going to be narrating the footage for you. The Rembrandt painting is behind me, and I'm joined here by my microphone, my blue Yeti microphone. So as you see, what I'm doing here is I'm starting off with a very simple envelope I've already made. An indication for where the top and the bottom is going to be now painting in the side of the head there's the corner of the rough the little fabric of clothing that uh, the model is wearing in this Rembrandt painting as you see I'm much more uh, I'm painting in a much slower pace okay so you know when I'm not painting and talking at the same time so that is what I'm doing here the voiceover style uh, you'll notice that in the footage I'm much more relaxed there are going to be some moments where I'm going to be a little bit more silent in my narration just so that I don't fill up the episode with too much talking uh, but in any case please feel free to draw or paint along with me so as you see it's a very simple composition okay I'm going to be having a little silhouette uh, going on here, uh, meaning uh, on silhouette, no, vignette, sorry, I'm going to have a vignette, so the bottom portion of the, uh, you know, the, the painting is going to be left unfinished, or should I say less finished than the areas above, and now I'm going to be putting in a little indication for the top uh, portion of the head, as you see there, now I'm starting to put in a little uh, indication mark for the ear, okay, so uh, the important thing right now really is to uh, have a composition that I like, a composition that I feel like I can continue to work on. Uh, composition really is the main step in pretty much all of my paintings. And then after this, I'm going to go directly into block-in stage. And remember, block-in stage is just going to be um, simplifying the forms into a series of straight lines and angles and working with those straight lines and angles for as long as possible. And I'm actually at this point in the painting transitioning into the block in stage i'm starting to you know try to hone in on the outside shape of the model's head now at this stage i'm trying to keep the painting rather loose but at the same time i want to have uh, a great degree of specificity with those simple marks that i'm making it's important to uh, be as objective as possible especially in this stage And there you see I'm starting to indicate the bottom of the beard. I'm not entirely sure how uh, far down the beard. I wasn't sure how far down the beard was going to go at that point. Um, but more or less the beard is a little more flexible uh, than the interior shapes of the face. So now you're going to see me start to put in the center line. Uh, that it's not the center line. The axes of the eyebrows. That's going to be the axes of the eyebrows. And now I'm going in with the center line. So the center line is giving me the tilt of the head. Notice how with my brush I'm looking at the angle of the head. So the, the head is a, at a little bit of an angle, very slight however. So that's what makes this pose rather difficult when the tilt is slight. So the slightest tilt is going to make this even more challenging if you would ask me. Um, so at this point I was pretty much locking into uh, that very slight tilt. And as you can tell, uh, the photo reference is a little bit smaller uh, just because, again, the camera, as you notice, is at an angle with respect to me just so I can move back and forth uh, freely and get some of these um, camera angles that you'll be seeing throughout the demonstration. And there I am starting to lock in the angle of the eyebrows okay like I said this is kind of a long episode it is a little bit interesting to talk about um, you know about painting for as long as this episode is going to be so please feel free to get out a sketchbook or your watercolors your gouache your whatever materials that you have your crayons Julie if you're watching and just draw along with me this is gonna be a very long episode it looks like it's going to be a long episode. Um, so now I have the axes of the eyes. Um, 
mapped out there so I have the angle and if the angle were to move it's okay um, the important thing really is to start with something okay uh, be as objective as possible and as you see here I'm really really trying to use a very simple simplified geometric shape for the eye socket you see there's not really any kind of indication of eyeball or iris just about yet Now as I start to lock in the um, corner of the concavity of the eye socket on the eye to the left of your screen, at this point I'm s really starting to put my foot down on that angle, that angle between the eyes. And remember the center line of the, uh, the face, so the center line of the face is perpendicular to the axes of the eyes, eyebrows, and the axes of the nose and the mouth. So that's kind of helping me orient the proportions of the head in space. Now you see I'm starting to block in the shadows. So the shadow shapes are going to be a very useful tool for the drawing, especially um, in the umber sketch, which is the stage that we're in now. It's important in the blocking as well because it helps you see, I think, with a little more clarity uh, when you have the uh, shapes of light and shadow. And trying to get the shapes of light and shadow, uh, I'm trying to get them at about, I don't know, about like a, I don't know, 85, 90% uh, accuracy, which, you know, 10% off is actually a lot uh, when it comes to portrait drawing or portrait painting. So. I'm giving myself a little room to work with here because I know that when I get into the color stage, I'm pretty much going to be attacking the painting a la prima, one, one shape at a time, one plane at a time, and therefore I'll be actually adding more specificity onto the painting. And there we're starting to put in a little bit more of the dark shape on the corner of the side of the ear. Then we have a little bit uh, that we placed in earlier for the, uh, the hat that the model's wearing. And there we're starting to solidify the nose. At this point I actually had the nose a little bit long, uh, but I didn't realize it yet in this stage of the painting. So. Um, you know, if you're taking my portrait painting class currently, um, just like I said in my class this Monday, the nose is going to move quite a bit. And noses are actually much easier to move than eyes, in my opinion. Uh, so that's why I tend to focus on the main triangle the most. The main triangle being, you know, one dot for the one eye, a dot for the other eye, a dot for the nose, connect all the dots and you have a triangle, that main triangle. If you can get that main triangle in in the relatively correct position, then you know the rest of the shapes surrounding uh, the main triangle should be relatively um, easier, should I say, to move around. But in any case, I had the nose wrong at this point, and um, you know, I ended up correcting it later. Not sure if it was 100% accurate, but ended up correcting it at some point afterwards. All right, well, at this stage now, we're actually starting to put in the uh, the shapes for the eyes. Notice how I'm standing back. So uh, the eyes were kind of tricky. I was kind of hesitant to put the eyes at this stage of the painting, still fairly early on in the painting. Um, but I knew it was, it was about time to do this. Uh, so using just a simple kind of dot, really, for the iris, and then uh, putting in the angles for the eyelids surrounding the um, the dots that I put in for the iris, making sure that those marks for the corners of the eyes are lined up with that uh, axis. 
Now, I'm working both of the eyes at the same time as you can see in the footage, kind of bouncing from one eye to the other eye. And that's just so that, um, you know, you can, you can tell that I am trying as much as I can to maintain that angle because that angle is going to be very, very challenging later on. And it's also challenging that the pose is nearly centered. It's a little tiny bit three quarter to, um, you know, to the model's right side, but it's still very close to centered. And that also adds a little bit of difficulty to the painting. And now, as you see, um, at this point, I had the main triangle relatively established. So now I'm starting to just draw all around the side of the, um, the main triangle, putting in a little shape there for the mustache. And a little axis marked, just a single brush stroke there for where the mouth is going to fit. And I'm even putting just a slight little light wash in there for, um, you know, indicating the darker uh, tones for the facial hair. Or should I say the shadows for the uh, facial hair? And then I'm painting a little bit more of a dark shape surrounding the corner of the ears. Now, I will say, I will admit, this is actually my second try uh, with this master study. Um, you know, I usually say that it does take me a couple tries now and then to get the, uh, you know, the pose to work or the painting to work. This one, actually, I did end up having to paint twice. Uh, I kind of messed up pretty bad on the first attempt at this master study, though I was, yeah, I was actually still recovering from, um, I had a virus, just a simple cold virus um, a couple weeks ago, so uh, never mind, that's not, a, I'm not trying to throw in excuses, I messed it up the first time, uh, so this time happened to be a little bit better, so that's why, you know, you're seeing this footage. And now we're just putting in a little light wash of value for the cast shadow. Remember, cast shadow means a shadow that is projected. So suppose you have uh, yourself, you're walking along, uh, you know, the boardwalk, and then you notice your shadow on the boardwalk. That is the shadow that's being casted by your body, you know, sunlight hitting your body, casting that uh, projected shadow onto this uh, boardwalk. That's essentially what that cast shadow is on the article of clothing that the model is wearing, also known as a ruff. And here we're actually gonna we're actually mapping out another cast shadow. Okay, so that's gonna be another cast shadow on the side of the ruff. And there we're putting a little quick and decisive mark for the corner of the shoulder. There you have the block in. Okay. So now that we have our uh, linear block in, for better or for worse, as you notice, the nose is still pretty long. Um, now we're going to start to jump into the plane. So I usually say pick a plane, any plane, place it down, and then start to relate the planes surrounding that area. Now this is a combination of both the classical approach and the alla prima approach. So alla prima meaning painting wet on wet, wet layers of paint on top of wet layers of paint, or you can also say just you know completing a painting all in one sitting. Uh, so from this point on, we're going to be treating it like an alla prima. So painting uh, you know wet paint onto wet paint essentially. Uh, so I started off with the glabella. Okay, the glabella was very very bright. Plane. So now I'm relating all the planes surrounding the glabella. So now we have a little bit of a side plane on the corner of the glabella there as it turns into the concavity of the eye socket uh, towards the right of your screen. At this point, I'm most likely standing back and mixing my colors. And there we have another uh, simple shape there for the uh, 
the eye, the corner of the side of the nose. Now then, there is going to be a lack of um, palette footage. In this one, I did have a little bit of a, a camera mishap. So the uh, there's going to be less footage of the actual color mixture, so I apologize for that. Um, but in any case, uh, I'm going to be explaining the colors, that my color choices at this point. And if you're curious as to what colors are on my palette, I'm going to have that typed up in the description box down below for you to scroll down, to scroll down to the description box down below, and you'll see uh, the colors typed out there for you. So anyway, the light for the glabella is pretty much just titanium white, yellow ochre, a little bit of nickel yellow. Okay, as we moved on to the side of the glabella, it's mostly titanium white and the nickel yellow. Now, as we're painting in that uh, frontal plane for the nasal bone, now we're starting to add a little bit of Venetian red, just a tiny, tiny touch of Venetian red for the, um, you know, the red kind of earthy uh, flesh tone on the nasal bone. And now we're starting to apply a very similar color. Blech similar color the burnt sienna is now going to take effect into uh, our mixtures here now i'm using the burnt sienna for the kind of warm pinkish tones on the uh, upper eyelid upper eyelid to the left of your screen and now we're starting to put in a little bit of a darker tone for the um, the concavity of the eye socket so the concavity of the eye socket is going to be it's going to be in shade. shade. It's going to be in shade. It's going to be darker. It's going to be a little bit warmer. So that's when the alizarin crimson permanent or alizarin crimson whichever you have or would like to use is going to take effect. Remember the alizarin is a very good tinting color which allows you to get a kind of reddish dark tone and it's very useful for uh, flesh tone painting. Alright, so now we're starting to paint in the top plane of the side of the um, the cheekbone. Okay, so very simple combination of titanium white, uh, cadmium red, and yellow ochre. Okay, so it's a little bit more pink than the footage appears. It, the footage looks like uh, a little too light. And it appears that the camera has picked up uh, some strange strands of... Uh, the fiber of the canvas. I don't know. Either way, when this is uploaded to YouTube, hopefully that doesn't show, but if it does, I don't know why I did that. Um, so now I'm going to be picking and choosing which planes that I want to develop. And as you see, I'm pretty much focusing on the main triangle. Even still, a lot of emphasis goes into the main triangle. And now I'm starting to paint in the darker plane on the corner of the side of the eye socket to the right of your screen that I as I recall was burnt umber and a little bit of yellow ochre so it's kind of a earthy green tone but that burnt umber gives it a little bit of the richness a rich kind of warmish tone to that half tone and there you have we're starting to put in the bottom of the um, lower eyelid for the eye on the right of your screen okay so I'm relating each of these values to one another okay so if you were in my class just this Wednesday I was talking about relating the planes to one another and if you're w watching and you're like what he's teaching class somewhere yes I teach in Howard County Arts Council but in any case now we're starting to paint in the corner of the maxilla and now relating that to the corner of the side of the nose see how the warmer tones are now starting to appear in the uh, the mid-tone range see there you go so now we're starting to put in the dark light and in terms of the color combinations that is very very likely to be influenced by a little bit of cadmium orange so I do like to use cadmium orange or my cadmium red um, sometimes Venetian red I kind of sneak it into the half tones the dark lights remember the dark light is the half tone just as light transitions into shadow um, you know, it's a very telltale sign of the curvature of a certain form. So as you notice, the nose is much more curved than the, uh, the planes of the face, the flat planes of the face. So the nose is actually uh, going to have a much faster gradation of tone. And there we're starting to put in a little bit of the uh, half tone for the side 
of the, the cheek, and then a little bit of a side plane for the top of the nose. And now we're starting to move up in the value scale towards the uh, the cheekbone. So I, I tend to look for areas where a lot of stuff is happening, and I tend to focus a lot of my attention on those areas where a lot of stuff is happening. Notice how with the cheekbone and stuff, the cheekbones, I'm not, I haven't really done much in that in those areas yet, just because I like to put more focus on things where a lot of stuff is happening, like the eyes, the nose, and then the side planes of the, uh, you know, the side planes of the uh, cheekbones. And especially with the forehead, the forehead's a little more flat. So see how I'm starting to put in that dark light uh, for the corner of the side of the cheekbone to the right of your screen. And again, that's influenced by the cadmium red, most likely cadmium red burnt sienna cadmium orange with a little bit of sap green just a tiny little touch of sap green probably to kill off the the heat of the burnt sienna and now we used a little bit of titanium white and the cadmium red and probably the tiniest bit of the uh, burnt sienna just so it's not such a bright you know vibrant uh, red rosy red for the cheekbone and now we're going into the maxilla the areas surrounding the side plane of the nose pretty much the same color just a little bit uh, darker a darker variation of that color so again see how there's a darker warm tone for the side of the um, glabella glab the side of the cheekbone the zygomatic bone anyway side plane of the cheekbone now you see that you know starting to put in you know much uh, darker kind of a dark richer tone for the corner of the cheekbone and the areas around the cheeks are usually uh, the, the pinkest that they're gonna get when it comes to the flesh tones depending on the model of course uh, but Rembrandt certainly did push the uh, the warmth in that area of the face and now you see I'm starting to paint everything in plane by plane so what I'm looking at at this point in the painting is closing up the cheek uh, cheekbone structures okay a little bit of a lighter plane there just trying to get the curvature of the planes to work and then I'm going to be moving on to the uh, you know the other planes surrounding uh, the face and again pushing a little bit of the warmth for the cheekbones there and then softening on oh, cheekbone the side of the nose. I'm messing up a lot today. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Now, now you see I'm starting to put in more of a uh, under plane to that top plane that we put in for the um, the uh, cheekbone. Uh, now starting to put in a little bit of a darker tone underneath of the uh, the uh, cheekbone. As I was saying before, this kind of stuff can get repetitive, so there will be times where I won't talk as much just so I don't, you know, cover the footage with too much talking, just to give you, you know, um, more painting footage to draw or paint along with. And there I'm starting to put in the uh, side plane for the corner of the forehead. Okay. So side plane for the corner of the forehead. Now we're starting to work our way up towards the superciliary arch. So the area right above there, right over there, where you're seeing the um, brush stroke. And then that's pretty much going to be our brightest plane on the forehead. And that's pretty much just titanium white and the uh, the nickel yellow. So titanium white, nickel yellow, and then more of the uh, Venetian red is going to come into play as we work towards the more uh, frontal planes of the skull. And then you see as I move the brush kind of sporadically, uh, you know, kind of like patting the paint down. That's usually just because I'm trying to see that right there on the forehead. You can see exactly there. Because I'm trying to soften 
an edge. So just softening an edge. That's why you see me, you know, patting the uh, the brush stroke to soften, as you see right there in the footage. And as we soften out the uh, the planes around the uh, the face, after this stage, I will then be moving on into the uh, the small plane stage. So the the stages are compositional stage. So large abstract shapes shapes <laughs> large abstract shapes for composition simple straight lines and angles for the block in then we move into the large plane there it is so that's the large plane stage for the face okay notice how I have a much smaller brush there okay now that much smaller brush is going to be used for the eyes okay and there's gonna be a lot of footage for the eyes so if you're curious as to how to take an eye from this simplified stage that you're seeing in the footage there to a much more finished stage stay tuned because you're gonna have plenty of footage on how to develop the eye so remember the sclera the white of the eye okay the white of the eye is not white it is usually some type of half tone so I use a little bit of titanium white ivory black and some of the flesh tone in order to get that value and there's a little bit more ivory black and flesh tone for the uh, shadow side of the sclera so there, I'm starting to put in the shadow side of the sclera. I just realized that this camera angle is cropping my hands. Whoops. But in any case, now you're seeing how I'm starting to put those um, darker shapes underneath of the upper eyelid. So the darker shape is going to be an accent. And the accent mark is the area where one area of form blocks the light from another area of form. It's kind of like, like like a sandwich, like the value is sandwiched in between uh, certain forms. So I made pretty sure to, you know, put my foot down on my lightest light and my darkest dark, as you noticed here. And, you know, if I were live demonstrating, so if I were talking and painting at the same time, I wouldn't have actually been able to tell you this in hindsight. But what I did there uh, was I put in the lightest light, the darkest dark, and now I'm able to control the range. So I'm controlling the range between all of these values and starting to uh, basically kind of finesse these values so that uh, you can read the form turning the, the light traveling across uh, the uh, planes of the eye. So it's very much going to be all about relating all of the planes to one another. This is a very conceptual thing. Um, you really have to kind of conceptualize which planes are facing the light less than other planes. All right, so now I'm starting to put in yet an even darker shape for the um, the iris. So at this point, I was actually starting to paint in the hues surrounding the iris. Uh, so the iris has a little bit of a, a warmer kind of brownish color underneath of the pupil. And there I actually used the back end of the brush to put in the highlight. And the highlight was most likely... Uh, the titanium white mixed with a little bit of the um, nickel yellow. And now we're putting in the top plane of the uh, lower eyelid. Now you see that the form for that eye is starting to read pretty well, okay? So you may want to backtrack the footage if I lost you at any point in how I was able to take the forms from that very simplified kind of blocky mass to where we are now. Because now, at this stage, the eye is very, very close to nearing completion in terms of getting the structures to read three-dimensionally. Now, what is the one thing that got these values? I just gave it away. What is the one thing that got these forms to look dimensional? Yeah, the values. Controlling the value range, knowing how to work with the values is key. It's key to getting... Um, these shapes to read as something moving from something that's two-dimensional to a more three-dimensional construct
and now you see we're starting to put in even the highlit regions of the um, the upper eyelid. So again, titanium white, most likely titanium white and Venetian red. I don't think I used any other, you know, more complicated color mixtures for that area. And now it's just about softening around the corner of the eyes. Now we're softening around the corner of the uh, the uh, eye socket. So this is kind of an in-between value. I tend to call this kind of a pathway, uh, bridgeway value, because it is there is a side plane on the corner of the eye socket, but then there's also a top plane to that side plane, kind of turning the form around ever so slightly. And now we're putting another little kind of bridgeway form uh, between the side of the tear duct uh, turning into the side plane of the nose, uh, moving up towards the nasal bone. We're, basi we're basically working all around the side of the eye now, just kind of softening all the shapes uh, surrounding the eye. And there you have it. There is the eye <laughs> to the left of your, your screen. I probably should have done that zoom in shot after the second eye was painted. Oh, okay, and at this point in the painting, at this point I had already noticed the nose was messed up. So after standing back, um, I noticed that the nose was a little too long. So now you're gonna see how I moved the nose up. So I started off with the shadow beneath the nose. And um, again, if you're in uh, my portrait painting class, I was demonstrating this for you. So you saw how I moved the nose up in this uh, fashion starting off with the shadow underneath of the nose or whatever kind of plane is underneath of the nose just use it to push the nose up And at this point, I also noticed that the shape of the shadow uh, surrounding the nose was also a little bit off. So I'm starting to put in uh, a little bit more of a refined shape for the cast shadow on the side of the nose as well. See there, now I'm using uh, verticals and horizontals just to make sure that the center line is perpendicular with the axes of the eyes. There you have it. So the eye to the right of your screen has just been painted in pretty much in the blink of an eye. Um, and again, no pun intended there. Um, or maybe pun intended. Oh, whatever. Uh, so the eye to the right of your screen was painted in the same type of way as the eye to the left of your screen. So showing you the footage twice probably wouldn't have been the best thing to do. So that's why I edited it. Edited it. <laughs> um, but remember, the most important thing was first checking the axes of the eyes, making sure it was perpendicular with the center line of the head you know, before putting in uh, those shapes for the eyes. And even if the eye was a little bit off, you know, it's not the end of the world to correct. It's just a little bit more difficult to correct the eyes than it is to correct the nose and the mouth. So now you see I'm starting to put in a little bit of a darker tone for the side of the ear. Now, um, 
I chose to make the ear a little bit darker and a little bit uh, more kind of a rosy pink. It appeared that way in the photo reference that um, I used, so I just chose to stick with what I, I saw in the photo reference. So I'm going to keep the ear uh, very simplified. I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to put much less, uh, you'll see me putting in less uh, information into the ears than you see in the original Rembrandt. But just enough, just enough to get the uh, the effect of the uh, the helix and the anti-helix, the, the corner of the ear, um, to read. And there I'm putting in a little mark, though it's kind of impossible to see for where the tragus would fit. When I was filming this, I thought that I would actually be able to see that brush stroke, but I don't really see it uh, for where the tragus was supposed to fit. And now I'm starting to put in the um, a little bit of a mixture of burnt umber. Uh, that's most likely burnt umber sap green and uh, the flake white for the side of the face. And again, I, I highly apologize for the lack of uh, palette footage with this one. In an ideal world, I really want a camera crew to be, you know, following me around as I'm painting so I can get that footage and, you know, have it edited so that this would be much more, you know, comprehensive. But... Now I'm going to use a combination of two different brushes, a light brush and a dark brush that I will eventually confuse with one another, but at this point they're not confused yet. So it's a very simple combination of the Burnt Umber Sap Green for the darks and same color, add flake white to it, um, and that's what you'll get for the lights for the facial hair. Um, I'm going to show you how I paint in the shadow, okay? And then we're going to get into some of the light shapes into the facial hair. And then I'm going to do another cut um, just because, I, as I recall, at this point in the painting, I did get a little bit repetitive as I was putting in more shapes. But there's the cast shadow, the bottom right there uh, for the mustache on the left side of the screen. Okay, so I made very certain to put in those dark accents first. And now we're starting to put in some of those lighter planes, as you see there, with a separate brush, okay? Same type of brush, just a different brush. Um, and now we're starting to put a little more finesse for the uh, the mustache. Okay, so um, I'm using soft brushes, smaller brushes on purpose. Uh, so the idea is that the brush stroke itself does some of the work for me, you know, that I, I think it's a good idea to be a little bit lazy when it comes to painting so that you, you know, you get the paint itself to do some of the work for you. So that's why these smaller brush strokes um, eventually will look like strands of hair. And I'll actually go in with a, a tiny brush again, the tiny one that I use for the, um, the eyes, and actually just kind of put in the indications here and there of some of the hair. And there we're starting to put in the mouth, okay? So I won't do the cut yet, so um, I'm going to show you how I uh, put in the mouth. So first I put in the shadow underneath of the lower lip. There's that tiny brush, and I'm putting in the accent. Remember the accent is kind of like a sandwich, right? When one form meets another form, blocks off the light, and, um, you know, creates that darker value. And I remember I was kind of nervous at this point. At this point when I was painting the mouth, I wasn't sure if I had placed the mouth a little too close to the nose. But at this point, I just kind of went with it either way. And now I'm starting to put in the, um, the upper, upper lip. So with the upper lip, again, it's just a simple combination of the usual flesh tones that I was talking about before. The burnt umber, yellow ochre, um, cadmium red with the flake white for the flesh tone. But it most likely had a little bit more burnt umber and cadmium red since it was darker and a little bit warmer. Okay, there I am putting in the little shapes for the mustache. Little shapes of light. All right, so now we're starting to put in all of those dark shapes for the hair. Okay, the hair, the hair, for the hat. Okay, so for the hat. All 
we're starting to put in all of those dark shapes. I used a little bit of a medium, okay? Remember that medium is Neo McGill medium. Now, um, the color is thinned out a little bit just so uh, for more of a practical reason, really, just so I can move the paint across very quickly. So now we're going to start to paint in the, the rough, or we have started painting in the rough. So um, remember the rough is the collar looking thing surrounding uh, the model's head. So I started off with the titanium white and ivory black and a little bit of burnt umber just so it's not uh, too blue. As you know, ivory black can be kind of bluish. So there's a little bit of burnt umber influence in that darker tone. Now I started putting more titanium white and the paint is pre it's pretty thin. It's fairly thin. Okay, see how I'm starting to go really fast with the rough? So I'm just letting the brush strokes kind of uh, illustrate the the curls that exist on the rough. Okay, starting off with those darker values, and I'm going to build my way up towards those lighter values and kind of put some more closure into the forms. There I am, starting to put another lighter half tone. Okay, moving very, very fast. This is probably going to be the fastest uh, shape that I paint in this. Um, well, shape with form, right? There are multiple forms in the rough. So this is going to be the fastest form, I think, that I paint here. See? Letting the brush strokes illustrate the little curls of the rough. Even a little light patch of uh, value right there. And again, moving very quickly. Now, most likely mixing... Uh, color with more of the titanium white. There it is. There you see. Letting the brush strokes illustrate uh, the kind of the texture, the curls of the rough. There, very, very swift motion of the brush. Very, very brave brush. Always keep a brave brush. All right, so there you have it. So um, I'm using this sap green, okay, and the burnt umber. Sap green, burnt umber. I, as I recall, it had a little bit of yellow, so it was most likely the, the nickel yellow. And as you see, it's actually going to be a little bit lighter next to the shadow. And then when we get to it, it's going to be a little bit darker next to the light. And that's no coincidence. That's a very classical trick to use to contrast. You know, when the light um, area of the face has darker shadow, darker, darker background <laughs> near it, it helps to contrast the face. When the shadow has a lighter value next to it, it actually also helps to contrast the face. And there I'm starting to work all around. I did use a little bit of odorless mineral spirits, as I recall, in this stage of the painting, uh, along with the uh, Neo McGilt medium to uh, paint it faster. And at that point, after that brush stroke, I had noticed, yep, Rembrandt did that. He made it darker. There it is. See, now it's darker there on the light side of the face and lighter on uh, next to the shadow side of the face. See how it creates a nice contrast, which helps to push the effect of light even more. Now, this part took some bravery, okay? Brave brush. Brave brushing it at this point is going lightning fast. Lightning fast. So now just filling in the last little areas of the background. And again, it was thinned out with a little bit of the odorless mineral spirits and the Neo McGilt together to get the paint to flow like that. Now we're just putting in the final brush strokes. As I said before, today's episode was much longer, especially than, you know, um, uh, our previous episode. Uh, so hopefully the footage, you know, back and forth, the painting footage and then me talking to you helps to... Um, you know, create more of an experience for you. So that being said, I really hope that today's episode helps you out. I wish you the best in all of your artwork. Please feel free to share this video with others. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you are not subscribed to it. Um, and I'll see you on the next episode.